Movers and Stakers is sponsored by the National Scenic Byways Program. Ball State University. The Discovery Group and WYPB. I'm overdue for a long, long ride Out on the old national road Daddy drove the roller that laid that asphalt down It's gonna carry National Road in Indiana, a vestige of days gone by. Not much to look at as roads go, but behind these doors, inside these buildings, before it was named US 40, the National Road has a rich history that tells the story of Hoosiers, the people from Indiana who cleared the woods, built the roads, and established towns from Richmond to Terre Haute. Some of them moved on, some of them stayed and staked their claims. These are the stories of the movers and stakers. In the early days of our country, before there were any roads into the area we now call Indiana, there were natural buffalo traces and inconspicuous Indian trails. Early traders and surveyors followed those paths, but they proved too narrow and crooked to easily move goods back and forth from the newly opened Northwest Territory to the civilized and populated eastern seaboard states. Our founding fathers wanted to build a national road that would make overland travel easier. Borrowing from a Bible verse, they had a vision completely different from that of the Native American. Every valley shall be filled and every mountain shall be brought low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough ways shall be made smooth. Just after Lewis and Clark's expedition, President Thomas Jefferson commissioned the construction of the, this national road to enter into the interior of the United States. And from 1806 until about the 1840s, the national road was constructed between Cumberland, Maryland, and Vandalia, Illinois. Also called the Cumberland Road, it was to connect the Potomac and Ohio waterways and eventually connect to the Mississippi. But it takes a long time to build a road through the Alleghenies by hand so the Indiana segment wasn't built until the 1830s. And so they came, by the thousands. Movers, they were called. I think that restlessness, that mobility, goes back to the founding conditions, the sorts of people who settled this country, the scale of the place, the fact that most of it was wide open to settlement, again, once the native people were forced out. And some people never got over their restlessness. Some people were roamers and ramblers forever, always looking for a better opportunity over the next hill. Movers weren't just men. Twelve identical statues across America pay tribute to the women who came along. We are on the corner of Glen Miller Park in Richmond, Indiana, which is the eastern bookend of uh, the National Road in Indiana. And it is marked by this beautiful statue of the Madonna of the Trail, one of 12 along US 40 through the entire country. The DAR, Daughters of the American Revolution, commissioned these sculptures in the 1920s. It represents the spirit of that American woman heading west with her man and keeping things together. Women and children often walked alongside the wagon. The movers needed a place to rest. The animals could only pull a covered wagon 20 miles on a really, really good day. So entrepreneur John Huddleston built a rest stop on this first federally funded interstate, just on the edge of Cambridge City. He built here, he came here to the point because he knew that this road was an important corridor, he knew people were going to be traveling along this and he wanted a part of that. He was a capitalist and he wanted to take a part of that. Huddleston built a house that was larger than normal because he intended to use uh, the property and the house uh, and uh, the barns and so forth uh, to make money off of the National Road. 
Uh, he had, uh, in fact, been involved in some of the construction of the National Road, uh, particularly the portion out in front here. Uh, one of the misconceptions is that you occasionally see uh, the Huddleston House uh, referred to as an inn. It was not an inn in the sense that there were 19th century inns. Uh, it was a traveler's rest stop. While these rooms uh, were used for sleeping, as I say, it was not quite the same as a normal inn. And uh, for this and for, for inns of the time, of course, uh, what you rented uh, was a space to sleep in. Um, the, uh, you did not have the luxury of renting the entire room. And so, for instance, uh, the bed that we have, uh, you might have a space in that, but then someone else coming along uh, could rent the other space in the bed. And then once the spaces in the bed were filled, um, there would be spaces on the floor uh, that you could rent. Uh, but staying inside would be preferable, if you could afford it, to uh, camping out uh, and sleeping out um, uh, in, on the ground, uh, perhaps under your wagon uh, overnight. The kitchen was much larger because uh, Huddleston figured uh, he could sell meals uh, to people, to travelers uh, on the National Road. We recreate uh, the hearth cooking experience uh, every fall and every spring. We have hearth dinners that, uh, where people get to come in and help do some of the preparation and experience uh, meals such as existed uh, uh, in the 1840s. This was uh, a basic part uh, of his National Road operation uh, because uh, people would come along and uh, they would want uh, to put their animals up uh, for the night. In the lower level uh, of the Yellow Barn, uh, there were some 27 stalls. Uh, so for a fee, he will put, uh, put your oxen or horses up uh, overnight uh, inside. 1840s was when Huddleston built his home here, and that's when uh, we really found that a lot of travel was going on through the National Road. Sunday, March 27th, crossed the Blue River, lost one of our tar buckets in fording. Roads getting worse. They're what are called corduroy roads, which were used up and every 10 feet, our wagons go hub deep between the timbers that the road is composed of. Distance traveled, 17 miles. William Richard Brown. The heyday of the National Road was short-lived. Just about the time the road was finished in Indiana, a new mode of transportation, the railroad, proved faster and cheaper to move goods. It's after the 1850s, the, the travel along the National Road's severely declined. Uh, people were taking the railroad and not taking the national road as often to, to get to one, from one place to the other. Uh, so obviously people were taking the railroad and not traveling the road, so therefore the, the, the construction of the road kind of halted. And so did some of the travelers. There were also people who decided to stay put. And they were the ones, for the most part, who founded towns, who founded colleges, who founded churches, who established various institutions that to this day we benefit from. It was the stickers, as the great Western writer Wallace Stegner called them, the people who decided to stick somewhere and to invest themselves and to stay put. I think sometimes what led them to, to stay in a place were, was the richness of opportunities there. Such is the story of the Hallman brothers of Terre Haute. The Hallman family started their business in Terre Haute in 1850 and were importers of spices and coffee, grew the business uh, and moved into this building in 1892. At the same time in the late 1800s developed uh, the brand of Clabber Girl baking powder, uh, became a full service food distribution company. And uh, today, the uh, Clabber Girl product and brand is still being produced at this facility along with several other uh, food ingredient products under the Clabber Girl name. We are sitting on the first floor of the Hallman Building, which is the uh, corporate office for Clabber Girl Corporation, in the heart of our museum. When you come into this museum for the first time, you will see, uh, which is behind me, the delivery wagon, which they used. Uh, to deliver baking powder. You will also see in a portion of the museum how they actually prepared uh, food and baked goods in the 1800s. You'll see a little bit of the history of how the company operated with the cashier stand where the employees, instead of getting checks, 
they would actually go up there and they would get slips, uh, would have their money in it. And behind that cashier stand is a portion of a letter that Francis Hallman wrote to Herman. And the family still has the original letter, but this is just a portion of it. And if you read that letter, it captures why immigrants came here. This was a land of opportunity. You could come here and be free. You could make a success based on your hard work. And I get goosebumps um, every time I read that. One can express his opinion freely, and there is not censorship. The laws are good, and wealth and well-being reign everywhere. We have a place chosen already called Terre Haute, west of here in the state of Indiana. This is a place of about 6,000 inhabitants. It's very well laid out, very flourishing and growing rapidly, clean and location healthy. Besides this, the territory is rich, wealthy farmers in the surrounding country and beautiful prairies. This place is, as I said, one of the best in this locality. In 1945, the uh, grandson of the founder, Tony Holman Jr., purchased the Indianapolis Motor Speedway kind of as a way to revive um, the history uh, of that in, the United, in Indiana and then as a way to promote the wholesale grocery business they thought it would be kind of a great idea and I don't think he really imagined at that point what it would be today which is the it is the greatest spectacle in racing. The success of the Holman family company also relies on Terre Haute's connection to the National Road. Our history and legacy is, is up and down and we have uh, what I consider to be our, our world headquarters uh, right here at 9th and Wabash in Terre Haute on the National Road. The family's uh, country home, if you will, was just east of town on the National Road is, is Rose Holman Institute of Technology, which you know my grandmother and grandfather were, were benefactors of that institution. And um, it's, it's all very important to us as a family. My mother lives out there today. We consider Terre Haute our home, our headquarters, and someplace that's always been a great place to live and, and, and a good place to come home to. About the same time the Holman brothers were establishing their grocery business in Terre Haute, Indiana's most famous poet was growing up along the National Road in Greenfield. James Lipton Riley was born in Greenfield, Indiana. He was born right on the National Road. His father built a house uh, right in, in the center of town. And Riley would say that his years in that house were the happiest of his life. My name is Danny Russell. I've been an actor professionally for more than 20 years, and about half that time I have portrayed James Whitcomb Riley in the younger days during the medicine show circuit, hence the flamboyish and colorful clothing. Uh, Mr. Riley was uh, a dropout. He left school at 16 with his mother's blessing. His mother Elizabeth said, Jamesy, I don't care if you quit school. Never let school get in the way of a good education. Then, of course, he had his own uh, business painting signs for a while called the Hoosier Graphics. He sold Bibles for a while in Greenfield. He worked for the Anderson Democrat in 1877 in Madison County, and in just four weeks, he doubled their subscription because of his frivolous little verses that he contributed. And then in 1883, his first book was published, The Old Swimming Hole. Mm -hmm. Father Reuben was traveling back from his law office in Indianapolis to Greenfield on the National Road. And he stopped and took pity on this poor, homeless German tramp and brought him back and gave him work on the Riley property for several months. Riley was so impressed with this individual that he later wrote The Raggedy Man as an homage to him. Oh, the Raggedy Man, he works for Pa and he's the goodest man ever you saw. He comes to our house every day and waters the horses and feeds them hay. And then he opens the shed and we all just laugh. I really think that Riley did romanticize the, the National Road, but I also believe that some of his characters that we, we see probably were actual people that, that traveled the, the um, National Road. Riley's Perhaps most famous poem is Little Orphan Annie. And she was a real person. She was really Mary Alice Smith, and they called her Allie. 
And when he first wrote the poem, he called it the elf child because she was very petite. And then he changed it to Little Orphan Alley. And then along came Little Orphan Annie. But he didn't make the change. It came from the printers. And he went down to the company very irate. How dare somebody change my poem? And what he found out was that the printer had changed the two L's in Alley to two N's, making the word Annie. Well, when he found out that this poem was just making oodles of money, he thought, I think I'll leave it Little Orphan Annie. And that's the true story. Little Orphan Annie's come to our house to stay and wash the cups and saucers up and brush the crumbs away and shoo the chickens off the porch and dust the hearth and sweep and make the fire and bake the bread and earns her board and keep and all us other children when the supper things is done we set around the kitchen fire and has the mostest fun listening to the witch tales that Annie tells about and the goblins will get you if you don't watch out. Mary Alice Smith known as Little Orphan Annie actually lived a full life. She moved down to the town of Philadelphia, which is on the National Road, just a few miles away from Greenfield. Raised a family there, married a man named Wesley Gray, and she's buried in Philadelphia. Riley gained enormous popularity on the lecture circuit, traveling all over America, going to Europe a couple of times. And he made his uh, fortune with his books of poetry, nearly 36 best-selling anthologies. He gave uh, Hoosiers a cultural identity and really put Indiana on the map in the 19th century. And the goblins will get ya if you don't watch out. Riley's poems about the road were written through a child's eyes but roads in Indiana were really in horrible shape. A well-known chant at the time went like this. The roads are impassable, hardly jackassable. I think those that travel them should turn out and gravel them. If something got uh, rough, got holes in it, we built what was called a corduroy road, and we think these are some timbers that were used for that purpose. Uh, they have marks on them where they have been hand-hewn with a broad axe and an adze to make them square and flat and they were laid across the road crossways the road would have went this way across these and uh, the wagons would have bumped over them the best they could government funds were allocated to building railroads so it took another invention the simple bicycle to call attention to roads again this was accomplished by a strong lobby called the good roads movement it originated with the bicycle craze of the 1880s. People everywhere, even women, imagine that, were climbing on their bicycles and wanting to travel from town to town, but the roads were very bad. The safety bicycle was invented around, right around 1880, so now at last women were able to ride bicycles safely. But they had no roads to take out of town. Once you're out of town, the roads got pretty bad, almost next to nothing. So there was a clamor from the bicycle riders who wanted to get out there in the countryside and tour. So that was the origin of it. Anton Hallman Sr. and Herman Hallman uh, Jr., the brothers, uh, started the Wheelman's Association. The Wheelman organization and the Hallman brothers and their, their father were very instrumental in getting the roads paved because they used that as a means of bringing awareness uh, to the communities that, hey, this is something we need to do. And eventually they were very successful. Congress made the investment into constructing roads that were not just uh, mud paths in the, in the countryside, but actually concrete paved roads for these bicyclists uh, to ride their bicycles. And of course, subsequently, because of their efforts, ironically, um, the cars soon followed. And, uh, and from what happened, uh, you know, the trans transportation interest on bicycles really shifted more so to, to the uh, automobile. Not so fast. We'll get to the automobile in a minute. First, we need to note the accomplishment of a champion bicycle racer. 
Indianapolis native Major Taylor was a famous cyclist. He was born in Indianapolis in 1878. He performed tricks at Hayes and Willett's Bicycle Shop on West Washington Street, um, part of the National Road. Major Taylor was a part of the cycling craze. However, as an African American, he was not allowed to race in many of the races that were held here and on many of the tracks here in Indianapolis. He left Indianapolis and went to Massachusetts, became a professional cyclist, and then by the time of 1898, he had won seven world records, he had become an American champion, and by 1899, he had become a world champion after winning the Sprint Championship in Montreal. It's one of those stories that has been buried in history. You know, it's almost like uh, there was a champion that was bigger than Lance Armstrong is today, that was African American from, from Indianapolis, Indiana, and his accomplishments were, for the most part, buried in the United States. I think that a lot of people don't understand the history of, of cycling and the impact that Indianapolis and Indiana had on, on cycling history. I mean, what Detroit is to automobile manufacturing and automobile development, Indianapolis was to cycling. You can still see bicycles on the National Road, especially during the rain ride. That's ride across Indiana. The Bloomington Bicycle Club started the ride across Indiana 21 years ago at the state line between Indiana and Illinois. It's called Ileana Road. It is part of the historic National Road. It's not US 40. We don't we ride on the original road for 2 miles when at which point we join 40. US 40 is a nice four-lane road that's 10 miles from Interstate 70. There's some historic towns like Centerville and East Germantown that have the old homes, 150-year-old homes that are still standing. Beautiful farmstead over by Stylesville on the south side of the road. It's the most beautiful homestead on the entire route. He's talking about Rising Hall, the exquisitely restored Italianate house built in 1872. Uh, I, st I started on this, rebuilding this house here at uh, 1982 when I bought it, and uh, it's, uh, we titled it Rising Hall. And uh, so many people ask, you know, what, what is that? Where did you get that? And I, I done some re research and found out that that's what they called a stairway back in England. In the old stairways, it was called Rising Halls. That's a perfect name for this because we've got so many halls in this house that the Rising Hall makes it good. This was a very prominent big house, not only the house but the barn, uh, built right in the midst of the, uh, of the Civil War um, on, on a major traffic route across the nation. This was indeed a, a landmark property. In uh, 1860, that's when the house was started, by Melville McAfee. When the Civil War came along, why, uh, the, uh, they stopped on it because uh, of the Civil War. At uh, that time then, President Lincoln made a deal with Mr. McAfee for him to uh, supply the mules for his Union Army, uh, which he did and um, he would ride horseback all over the country and find mules and then send them to wherever uh, the battles were going on. So then they went, went back to finishing the house and completed it in uh, 18, 1870. What uh, Walt and June Prosser have done here is to, to restore this house to a state of of dignity and grandeur. They spent uh, a good 10 years personally restoring this house, inch by inch, brick by brick, uh, board by board, and uh, Walt did it uh, his way, often with tools that he made himself. So this is really one of the great um, personal restoration stories that we have in Indiana. There's still many things I want to do with it. It's, uh, it keeps me busy all the time, and that's part of the reason I build it. This is one of the, one of the really special homes in Indiana, and it's, it's that way because, uh, because of what it is uh, historically, but also because of, of what the owners have done, what Walt and June have done with this place uh, is extraordinary. They've shared it. Uh, they've, made it they've made it part of the, the effort to 
call attention to the importance of the National Road. So it's a landmark in, in so many ways. The National Road built the rest of the nation. Everything that's here is because of the road. The National Road, Highway 40. Not nearly as fancy as Rising Hall, several original log buildings still sit on the National Road. One was discovered quite by accident when Ron Sanders' rental house burned. In 2001, um, I got up one morning and my, uh, the house that w was here, the, the residents of it were, were streaming out and uh, in a few moments we found out we had a little bit of a fire starting in it. And um, we had the catastrophe of the fire and, and shortly thereafter I had to make a lot of decisions on what to do with the building, with the house. and. Uh, we, we knew that there was logs in here. We really didn't know what it amounted to. What it turned out to be was a log cabin with a modern house built around it. It was basically a 24 by 18 structure. No roof, no porch, had a foundation, had a basement under it. We had to pull off all the lath work and all the chinking was still in it. And uh, it, it really was just, a four, just four walls. I made the decision to, to rebuild. Lots of people have stopped by during my construction and, and got friendships with them and got to look at some other cabins around the central Indiana that they had restored. Um, it's just been a wonderful experience and what it has happened to me and what it's brought to me. And now to the 20th century. The road didn't really change because the automobile was invented. It changed when the ordinary family could afford one. And that only happened with Henry Ford's Model T. I think my great-grandfather's vision for the Model T was pretty simple. He wanted to build a car for the great multitude. Uh, and I think that uh, with the uh, advent of the Model T and the production and the, the volume that was built, the, the, the public wanted better roads. And I think that's what happened. Springtime in the heyday of the Model T was a delirious season. Owning a car was still a major excitement. Roads were still wonderful and bad. To an American, the physical fact of the complete America is at best a dream, a belief, a memory, and the sound of names. My own vision of the land, my own discovery of its size and meaning, was shaped more than by any other instrument by a Model T Ford, E.B. White. I think what the Model T did for many people was it, it provided them the opportunity to get out. Not only did people use the Model T to go to church and go to work, but they actually took trips for the first time in their lives, many of them. This was maybe the first car they owned, and what they did was they took trips to places they had never been before. The first one I ever drove was in a field when I was nine years old, and I've had one, the first car I ever owned was a Model T when I was 16. And I've always, I've just been around Model Ts all, these, all my life. The Model T recently celebrated its 100th birthday in Richmond, but that's not the only story in town. This Quaker settlement along the Whitewater River was a bustling center of commerce. The Star Piano Factory evolved into a company that made very early recordings of a unique form of American music, jazz. Star Jeanette located here originally to build pianos. Star Piano Company owners were pretty savvy marketers. They knew that what drove piano sales was sheet music and a ready supply of new music. So it was only natural when they decided to get into the production of phonographs that uh, they would follow on shortly with records. Jeanette recorded virtually everything, and not just jazz, although uh, jazz is often associated most with Jeanette records, uh, principally because Musicians like Louis Armstrong, Big Spider Beck, uh, many others got their start here by making their first records for Jeanette. The original uh, recording studio down here was a brick building that apparently had been built for other reasons and was simply adapted, uh, made into a recording studio. The uh, recording setup was very simple. There was a horn, a big metallic horn that came through a wall on the other side of which was a recording apparatus. The musicians, sort of in a semicircle, played into the horn, and that activated a stylus which uh, uh, recorded the sound on a, a master uh, disc. It was a pretty good process. 
I should add that Jeanette also recorded famous speeches. William Jennings Bryan came here to record his famous uh, cross of gold speech delivered to Congress around 1901 or two, somewhere in there. And it was recorded here in the 20s. And that was not the only one by any means. Lots of speakers came to have their words committed for posterity. Jeanette Records, like most of the recording companies of that era, was killed by the Great Depression. But the legacy of the Star Jeanette Company, deep down in the Whitewater Gorge in Richmond, lives on, thanks to the work of the Star Jeanette Foundation. The uh, Jeanette Walk of Fame uh, consists of large medallions in the form of 78 RPM records that are embedded in the walk that you see behind me. Uh, they are com composite of uh, bronze and mosaic. The uh, upper half features a likeness of the artist that's uh, being honored. The lower part indicates which label he recorded on, uh, just as the label appears. And there are name plates uh, below or next to each record, each medallion, indicating what the artist was famous for and who sponsored the medallion. They've made many musicians famous, or at least got them started on careers that would make them famous, and popularized the music as well as documented it. Just a few miles away in Cambridge City, another art form, decorative pottery, was being created by a house full of sisters, the Overbecks. Or was it Overpecks? Their name was Overpeck, as it came from, uh, from Europe. But they, were, they said they were going to change it to Overbeck, which they did, but actually it's Overpeck. This family is buried at Riverside Cemetery here in Cambridge City, and the name on the stone is Overpeck. Whatever their name, their art pottery was critically acclaimed and brought the high prices of European art. But these small town women lived out their lives in a little house just off the National Road. Their parents were evidently um, aware of the arts and aware of the artistic abilities of their daughters. And so they were sent to art schools and um, their goal in life was to be an artist and not to marry and have children. The Overbeck sisters started their pottery business in 1911, and it continued until the last sister died, Mary Frances, who died in 1955. Harriet is on the left side of the photo of the six sisters, and she was um, not one of the potters. Harriet had gone to Europe to study languages and music, so she was talented that way and not uh, with pottery. Margaret Overbeck was the second oldest sister in the family, and it was Margaret who had the idea of starting a pottery here in this house after she discussed it with her sisters and taught them some of the basic principles of pottery making. Hannah is my favorite of the sisters because uh, she seems sweet. She's the one who designed most of these beautiful pieces, especially the pots. Elizabeth was the sister who went to New York to study at the School of Clay Working and was the technician for the group. She developed the glazes. She is the one who threw the pots down in the basement at the pottery wheel. Ida Overbeck was the oldest sister in the family. Ida became interested in photography. Ida and her sister Hannah opened a studio downtown here called Overbeck Sisters. Ida was the only sister who married. Mary Frances was the youngest sister and worked here the longest since she lived the longest of the girls. She lived until she was 78 years old. The Overbeck sisters, when they were at the height of their production, which was about 1920 to 30, were uh, making vases and um, exhibition pieces that went to museums around the country and uh, trophy vases, dinnerware, tea sets, all kinds of things uh, that were a little more sophisticated than these figurines that we see here on the mantel. The Overbeck sisters were a fantastic group of ladies that were talented beyond belief. Music, art, pottery, anything in the way of art. They weren't in business to become wealthy. They were in business to make art. Also in Cambridge City, you can see a New Deal mural on the wall of the post office painted in 1941 by Samuel Hershey. 
The New Deal was a wonderful program, I think, in the 1930s that created a lot of public art and public buildings. Typically of these murals, this particular one features uh, elements of local history and local scenes so that the people coming in to get their mail could really relate to that art. The Cambridge City mural depicts a farmer feeding corn to his hogs, a famous racehorse of the time, single G, and a truck traveling on the national road. Let's see, poetry, pottery, sculpture, jazz, art forms of all kinds can be found on the national road. In Terre Haute, two brothers enriched the world with their own art, musical composition and literature. These are the Dresser Dreiser brothers. We are standing on the banks of the Wabash in Terre Haute, Indiana, in front of the Paul Dresser home. Paul's home uh, was uh, the home of the Dreiser family. Uh, you may wonder why I say Dreiser family, and this is the Dresser home. Paul was in show business, and he thought that the name Dreiser was hard to spell and also was very hard to pronounce for some people, so he changed it to Dresser, which was his show business name. Paul had a famous brother that you would know as Theodore Dreiser. He kept the family name, and Paul, of course, went with the Dresser name. And Theodore was uh, an author, and actually, um, after his death, posthumously, was recognized as probably the greatest novelist uh, of, of the era. And uh, he wrote such things as uh, The American Tragedy and Sister Carrie. Paul Dresser was very attached to Terre Haute and his home, his mother. He came often uh, to visit her, so he traveled from afar back home to his, uh, his home place, and Theodore was not quite as thrilled with the area, so he was anxious always to get away. And ironically, when the two bridges were built here, the new bridges that replaced the old single bridge, the bridge that leads away from Terre Haute was named the Paul Dresser Bridge, and the one that was coming into Terre Haute was named the Theodore Dreiser Bridge. And unfortunately, I think the two should have been switched because um, Paul, as I say, was always coming home, and Theodore was always seeking a place away. In 1897, Paul wrote a song that was very dear to his heart and became our state song. In 1913, the Indiana legislature declared it our state song, and that song was on the banks of the Wabash, far away. There is some evidence that uh, Theodore was the person that started the thought process of this song. Paul loved this area and loved the Wabash River, so he elaborated on the lyrics and put the music to it. So both of them had a little bit of, uh, of uh, influence on our state song. Unlike the dark realism of Theodore Dreiser's books, another Hoosier novelist related to the National Road as a metaphor. In 1947, Ross Lockridge Jr. published his only novel, Rain Tree County. The National Road plays an important, symbolic role in this thousand-page bestseller, which had shocking content for those readers with post-war sensibilities about sex and religion. This is the famous, or perhaps we should say infamous, Raintree County by Ross Lockridge. Uh, it was published in 1947 and at that point in time uh, made Henry County, Indiana a household word. Uh, Raintree County was actually based somewhat fictitiously on the real Henry County, which is located in central Indiana. Uh, so many of the activities in the novel took place here, especially on the courthouse square. Uh, in fact, almost all of the activities took place right here where we're standing. If you look at the map on the inside page of the novel, uh, you'll see that it superimposes right over Henry County. Uh, the National Road going from east to west, indicating that Ohio is to the east, Indianapolis is 50 miles to the west. He visited Henry County often as a child in particular. His grandfather, a man named Shockley, lived down on the National Road in Strawn. Uh, most of the major characters in his novel are based upon ancestors or relatives of his who lived in Henry County. My great-grandfather, uh, who became known as John Wycliffe Shaughnessy in the novel uh, Raintree County, uh, was a village schoolmaster uh, who, however, aspired to, uh, to become a great poet. Uh, 
and my father uh, uh, decided that, well, um, perhaps uh, I could create a, a novel, an epic of my own featuring my, by then, deceased uh, uh, grandfather and make the national road into a kind of metaphor. Now we speak of, of people being uh, rooted on the one hand and nomadic on the other. It was a, a, a very complex and paradoxical metaphor. It was a metaphor for the, the West, for the journey West. Many readers missed the complexity and depth of Raintree County entirely. They were distracted by Lockridge's treatment of the topics of sex and religion. Uh, there were uh, several uh, sexual references in it. In fact, the original book had a picture or a drawing of a naked woman on the cover, which was very taboo at the time. There were also some very uh, suggestive and controversial religious beliefs that were, were mentioned in the book, too, that caused quite a stir at the time. There were two reasons that, that uh, it, it created quite a sensation. One was that it was regarded as blasphemous, uh, and it was condemned by a Jesuit priest very prominently. Uh, the other was the, this, the sexuality of it, and uh, a naked woman uh, appears as a giant geograph in the map of Raintree County. Uh, this, um, the painting of the book jacket uh, was above my bed. I lived uh, beneath it and didn't notice the naked woman until I reached puberty. This uh, conjunction of eros and, and nature was, is very strongly felt throughout the novel and in its day uh, was, was regarded as, uh, as uh, erotic in the extreme. Uh, I don't think the town got very excited when the novel came out. I don't think they really realized it was about Henry County. But when the movie came out, that was a different story. Uh, we're still seeing some economic development of the importance of Raintree County to Henry County. If you look in the, the local phone directory, you'll see there's probably 10 or 12 businesses. Raintree Tire, Raintree Alignment, uh, just goes on and on. Uh, so we did get some economic benefit from it. When one uh, drives through Henry County, the original of Raintree County, one looks in vain, I think, for vestiges of the, of the forests and the swamps that, um, uh, that uh, we find in the, the novel. One wonders if this is a landscape that was visionary always, uh, and uh, as, my, as my father uh, remade Henry County, as it were, uh, as a kind of uh, wish fulfillment of the imagination. Well, there is actually such a tree as the golden rain tree. Um, it is native to Asia. It's not a traditional uh, Indiana tree. Whoever finds the rain tree is supposed to find love and happiness and the meaning of life itself. Two Irish immigrants found love and happiness on East Washington Street in Indianapolis. In 1934, just months after prohibition was lifted, John and Ann McGinley decided to open a tavern, the Golden Ace, right on the National Road. Over 75 years later, it's still in the family and run by their sons, the five McGinley brothers. We welcome you all here this evening uh, to the McGinley's indeed fine establishment and they, as they celebrate their 75th year on this street. the highway of America. Well, the Golden Ace Inn is, uh, is a family tavern that was established in 1934. The best thing about McGinley's Golden Ace is that it stayed in the family. My mother and father started it, and uh, the family has continued the business, and uh, we think that the tradition uh, established has been great for the family. We're directly on the National Road. The National Road is US 40, US 40 here in Indianapolis is referred to as Washington Street. It was the busiest street going uh, at one time, and of course that's why Dad, I'm sure, put the bar here. If you had to come over here at 5.15 in the evening, you might be just walking in between cars, that they would be staggered so much, and uh, but backed up because, you know, it took a long time for people to get home, uh, lunch or during the evening, uh, just simply because of the amount of traffic that was there. 
One of the reasons they started the tavern after uh, 1933 when they got married in November, this of course was a depression, a prohibition coming to an end. And my father was only getting maybe two to three days a week pay, and they had saved up some money, and they realized they were going to have to uh, do something. And then from this, then they started the Golden Ace, March 1st, 1934. My parents, uh, hardworking, uh, very dedicated to uh, the tavern. Uh, our mom also worked in here on the weekends to help out, along with raising eight kids. Uh, my dad worked very long hours over here, but we were a very close-knit family growing up, and we still remain that way today. My mother, she uh, worked out a, uh, an agreement in her will that it was actually left to the members of the family. It was not left to any one particular person. And uh, that was part of the idea that, uh, that the tavern would keep the family together. And that's, it's worked over, it has worked very well over the years. And I think that's, that, that is the whole thing that the, that the, the tavern is, that, uh, that, that's kept us together, is that, uh, that it is an Irish tavern. And that uh, uh, tradition and loyalty and family and all those words that you can use to describe um, 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 togetherness is, is all about. Uh, it's about the whole family and wherever, whenever you need to help out, you have to do that. This is almost like another family member. It's a, it's a great asset to have the Golden Ace in the family because it's been here for so long, of course. We're going on our uh, 75th year here. We got a good core of, of, of you know, patrons that, that just keep coming back. We fought hard to keep the place open. We've had some good years and bad years, but uh, determination can carry a long way if you decide you want, really want to keep it open. Since this is our 75th St. Patrick's Day celebration, uh, we decided then to go all out for entertainment. So uh, tomorrow we are going to have uh, two groups from Ireland, actually two groups and one singer from Ireland, and then a local group. There's always a place to meet, there's always a place to be able to see family, and there's always a place to be able to catch up. G-O-L-D-N-A-C-E spells golden ace, proud of all the Irish blood that's in me, never learn man to say a word again me. G-O-L-D-N-A-C-E-U-C is a name that a shame never has been connected with. Golden Ace, that's we. The National Road was perhaps its busiest after most of its roadway was renamed US 40 in the mid 1920s. But again, that heyday didn't last too long. In the 1950s, uh, Dwight Eisenhower inaugurated, quote, the National Defense Highway System which was a highway system that was to go from, from one end of this nation to another end of this nation with limited access, um, high-speed transportation. And it was the design of structures on this work federally controlled uh, uh, far more tightly than one saw on the state highway system. And that's when you get what we now call these national defense highways, we now call interstate highways. And so to parallel 40, we got um, Interstate 70. The conformity of construction and signage contributed to what James Howard Kunstler calls the geography of nowhere. In his book, Blue Highways, author William Least Heat Moon barely notices he is in Indiana. The interstate afforded easy passage over the Hoosier land. So easy, it gave no sense of the up and down of the country. Worse, it hid away the people. Life doesn't happen along interstates. 
It's against the law. William Least, Heat Moon. Anywhere you drive in America, the interstates look more or less the same. They're engineered the same. The signs are, are the same kinds of signs. The bridges, the guardrails, the pavement itself, the clover leaves, all of these are very standardized and for a good reason because they make good engineering sense, those designs. The downside, of course, includes boredom, includes the, f the fact that the interstate highway system pays very little attention to landscape. It lowers the hills, it raises the valleys, it straightens out the curves. It has the effect of making the landscape less and less visible to the people who travel through it, unlike the National Road, where even though it was a good road, it was a road that paid much more attention to the contours of the land itself, and therefore the drivers had to pay much more attention to the contours of the land. So the National Road, with its string of local, distinctive, often quirky enterprises along it, and also domestic architecture, houses and barns and so forth, gave travelers a ri much richer sense that they were actually moving from one place to another as they drove the road. The interstate system gives one only the sense of motion without a sense of arriving anywhere very different from the place you left. In the 21st century, travel is an experience to be gotten through as quickly as possible. When we are here, we want to get there with no muss, no fuss, no delays. The roads we drive are simply means to an end. But this road has many more stories to tell, such as the Roses of Richmond, the Plainfield Diner, the Centerville Library, the clay bricks fired in the town of Brazil, the beautiful limestone courthouses, the historic National Road yard sale, the Van Buren Elm, and the Salisbury Log Courthouse. Slow down, look closely, and listen with open heart and mind to the stories of Indiana's National Road. We need to make sure we care for our past uh, and, and make sure that those unique places that are still there along the National Road today can still be experienced. And, and I think that that whenever we preserve our historic buildings, I think it sends a strong message uh, to, to people in the economic development industry that they care about the community. I'm overdue for a long, long ride.
Over.